Hello, welcome everybody. Good afternoon and good evening from Brussels. I'm Tamsin Rose, a Senior Fellow for Health at the Africa Europe Foundation. Welcome to this high-level special dialogue on climate and energy. This is the first of a series of three high-level special dialogues ahead of the sixth Africa Europe Summit. We have a fantastic lineup of speakers and experts for you today and a limited amount of time for our conversation exchange. So I invite everyone to please keep to your time limit. This is a complex issue with a rich history of discussion and issues. And it's well illustrated by a synthesis report that we sent to many of you in advance. And it will be shared on our website afterwards that has lots of good facts and figures to help understand the context of climate and energy in relation to Africa and Europe. We're delighted you've chosen to join us. And we hope that this is a time for shared conversation in an open and frank way to really explore where our futures can build together for our mutual benefits. It gives me great pleasure to introduce the first person who will give us a context for our conversation. And that's Mo Ibrahim, who is the chair and founder of the Mo Ibrahim Foundation. Mo, the floor is yours. Go ahead. Uh, thanks, uh, Tamsin. I, I would like really uh, to, to welcome our wonderful panel. Uh, we have a great uh, panel here. We have uh, President Makisal, President of uh, Senegal, and the incoming chair of the African Union. And we have uh, President uh, 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 Michel, uh, Charles Michel, who is, of course, the, the uh, President of the uh, Council of Europe. And uh, it's really wonderful to have both of you here. We also have uh, uh, C Commissioner Breton from, from France. Welcome. Thank you very much for joining us. Then we have two wonderful sisters, uh, Louise and Crisola. Uh, of course, Louise is, is the uh, Secretary General of, of uh, the Francophonie. And uh, she and uh, Crisola, who is a member of the European Parliament, are the co-chairs of our strategy uh, groups in the foundation. Uh, two wonderful ladies. And I think with such five wonderful people, we're going to have a very informative discussion. And uh, our purpose here really is have informal frank discussion about the issues here. There is a gap between Af how Africans look at the issue of climate and energy and how our European front friends look at them. It's time for us to have a frank discussion in order to help really feed into the summit, which we hope will be a different type of summit. Uh, with this, I'll hand over back uh, to Tamsin to really start the wonderful conversation. Thank you very much. And I also welcome the high level group uh, who are in this call. Uh, I cannot really mention everybody by name, but we have an amazing group of people here. Thank you all uh, for joining us. Thank you very much, Mo. And just to help the conversation go forward, just to let you know that this evening's event is translated. You have interpretation between French and English. You're able to choose the language that you want. If you look at the bottom of your screen, you should see a menu with what looks like a globe. You can use that to change between English and French because we have speakers who will be using the French language. So I'm delighted now to pass the floor to the President of the European Union, and that is uh, Mr. Charles Michel from Belgium, where we have the delight to be hosted. Mr. President, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you, and good afternoon, everyone. I'm very happy to virtually join this call I would like first to thank uh, the Africa Europe Foundation for its involvement, its dedication. Thank you, Mo, for your ongoing uh, uh, involvement to try and bring together European and African points of views. To cooperate, to coordinate a lot with our friend Maki Sal. Uh, we had the pleasure to be together in Senegal a few weeks ago. Maki, you were in Brussels uh, a few weeks ago in December with some uh, other African leaders. 
in order to have informal exchanges of views, in order to prepare the next summit we'll have in Brussels in February. I will just um, say a few words about the preparation of this, uh, this summit. First, I sincerely hope it will be the opportunity for a new paradigm, for a new approach, for a new alliance between Africa and Europe. And that's why we have tried the recent weeks, the recent months, to work a lot together, African friends, European friends, and thank you also for the role of this uh, uh, foundation in order to, to be certain that we share the same views as much as possible, that we share the same priorities, and that we are ready to take the same, the same measures, to decide together. Uh, it means that uh, we need to agree, it will be one of the goals of the summit, uh, on the principles for the, the future relationship between Africa and Europe. Mutual respect, sincerity, mutual interest, a role for the private sector, and how is it possible on both sides to improve the governance? First element, what are the foundations, what are the principles for the future relationship between Africa and Europe? Second element, the prosperity. We want more prosperity in Africa and in Europe. And it's a common interest, more prosperity, taking into account the global challenges, climate change, digital revolution, uh, energy, infrastructure, uh, health, and all those challenges. The importance also to finance, to channel the money we need uh, in order to make the right choices. And the importance also to take into account the, in, the, the, the accountability. Uh, in the past, this is not the first time that uh, we made great statements, <coughs> but we were not necessarily able to make sure that we were able to implement what we had decided together. That's why this question of the governance accountability, in my opinion, uh, should be an important element for this future partnership. And one last word, uh, and it's very important, about security and stability. How is it possible to have a political dialogue, to cooperate, to coordinate? How is it possible from the European side to develop the tools that are useful in order to support and to help our African uh, partners, our, our African friends, to develop African solutions in order to improve the level of stability, to improve the level of security? Voila, I won't be longer. You see the passion, you see the commitment. I, I think this moment, this summit, should be, and I hope will be, an important moment for the future relationship. We have many challenges that we need to tackle and to address uh, in common. And I'm very grateful again to all of you for your involvement, for your participation, because what's important is not only the meeting with the leaders, which is important, it's also the societies in Africa and in Europe. The more our societies will be interconnected, I think, the more we will be able to uh, succeed uh, together and to, to prepare a better, a better world because uh, we will be able to uh, prepare a better relationship between Africa and uh, Europe. J'arrête ici. Okay, I stop here and I give back the floor to um, the moderator. And I would like to give a warm welcome to my friend Macky Sol. Thank you very much, uh, Monsieur, uh, Charles Michel, the President of the European Council, for your kind words and also highlighting where it is that the two continents need to find a new way forward in the forthcoming summit. Let me now invite His Excellency, Mr. Macky Sall, the President of Senegal and the incoming Chair of the African Union, to say a few words. Well, thank you very much for these kind words. Good afternoon, dear friends. I'm very pleased uh, to be part of uh, this afternoon's discussion. I would like to uh, thank Mo Ibrahim, my friend Charles Michel, with whom uh, we uh, work together for a better partnership between uh, EU and Africa. I, I'm sure that the next EU a AU summit will be a summit without any complex a place, a venue where we will be able to listen to each other, where we will focus on the issues for the African continent, and we will try to find the best possible solutions to uh, those problems faced by uh, my continent. 
Mubram, uh, who is a member of this panel and who was uh, quite instrumental in setting up uh, the Europe Africa Foundation, will agree with me um, um, that we have uh, many friends on the European side. I'm thinking of Commissioner Breton, among many others. And altogether, in, as good friends, we need to look at the substance of the issues so that by the end of this summit, we can make a real step forward towards a renewed partnership between Europe and Africa. Of course, there are major uh, focuses on both sides. We are still in the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, we are still trying to uh, distribute vaccines uh, in spite of uh, all difficulties. But COVAX uh, uh, was a good way to uh, send vaccines to African countries. So we need to commend the efforts that were made. But this uh, pandemic shows that um, we are not on equal footing depending on where you live on this planet. So the problem of vaccine distribution on the African continent is a, a very relevant one. It is an acute uh, issue, and I think that before going to Brussels, we will have uh, reached 100 billion uh, um, uh, support. Um, how are we going to use that money? Uh, what about uh, energy? You know that Africa expects answers from Europe as part of solidarity. We are all committed for climate. African economies are among those that are polluting less. But uh, we are the part of the world that is most affected by uh, the aftermath and the consequences of the climate change. So we should not uh, uh, add some injustice on the on the shoulders of Africa. Um, by no longer subsidizing the fossil fuels as was decided in Glasgow, because this is uh, um, a real difficulty for the African countries. So. We need to achieve a 31% uh, ratio of renewables for electricity production. So telling now those countries that have hope with gas that there will be no longer any subsidies for fossil fuels is uh, uh, something that is unfair. On this specific issue, namely energy transition, uh, the African countries will speak with one voice. And we need to decide how long uh, these uh, energies will accompany the uh, setting up of electricity everywhere in Africa. We still have a lot of African people who don't have access to electricity who are off grid. And so uh, gas is an important uh, uh, fuel, not just in Africa, but also in Europe. We know that many European countries are still using gas. And I'm not even speaking of uh, uh, China or India. So together, we need to come up with a joint strategy that will be um, climate friendly, but that also takes into account the level of development of African countries. Another very important topic will be migration flows. Of course, we will uh, not avoid this topic. After the Malta summit, a trust fund was set up uh, in the amount of 1.8 billion euros. It was a first step, and we uh, really welcome this. But this is still far away from uh, the money needed by the continent. If we want youth, young African to uh, stay in Africa, we uh, need to provide Africa with more resources. We need to give Africa access to uh, better uh, conditions. In fact, the real issue for development of Africa is how to access to capital markets uh, with um, interest rates of 7, 8 percent uh, over maturity of uh, 6 to 10 years. No, 
we need really to uh, take up the challenges that we face on a daily basis. Of course, there are issues of transparency governance. We need to address all this, but by avoiding red tape bureaucracy and really uh, try and address this um, development that we are mostly in need. So in Brussels, we will need to discuss how all those topics uh, can be uh, solved. I think and I hope that in Brussels, we will make a big step forward towards a new, a renewed uh, EU-AU partnership. And the last point is the fight against terrorism. Uh, because uh, Africa is uh, the Achilles heel. Uh, when it comes to Africa, it's quite difficult uh, to uh, leverage resources. For 10 years now, we've been fighting at the United Nations to get a robust mandate for Mali. 10 years. And we uh, say that the issue is still uh, prevailing in Africa. So if as part of cooperation we manage to leverage more resources and uh, mobilize more African troops, then we could efficiently combat uh, terrorism. In the case of Afghanistan, of Syria, um, the whole world uh, combined efforts and joint efforts and um, Thousands of millions of dollars uh, were invested in uh, the fight against terrorism in those two countries. And this is not the case in Africa. So again, this is a matter that we need to discuss, how to finance the fight against terrorism in Africa. It is a very important topic because it is making our continent more and more fragile because now we have Sahel, uh, Southern Africa, Mozambique, the Horn of Africa, all those parts of Africa are faced with uh, terrorism. So I will stop here and I'm, of course, uh, prepared for any interactive dialogue. I'm quite optimistic when it comes to the relationship between Europe and Africa. Our two countries are on both sides of the Mediterranean Sea. We only have one and 14 kilometers uh, between the two of us. So. I think that we need to tango together to work hand in hand and any improvement, any development in Africa will benefit Europe and vice versa. Uh, Africa is a huge continent with a huge population and it offers opportunities to each and everyone. So Africa should not just be uh, the source of dispute um, between um, greedy uh, corporations and uh, countries. It can also offer many opportunities. It's useful to have this context, and you mentioned two issues that we're going to be picking up in the next two debates. We're going to be addressing next Thursday the issue of migration, and the following week we'll be looking at this issue of vaccine equity. But as you mentioned, the challenges that have been put in, in front of Africa in the energy transition are extreme and extraordinary. And we also have a quote from the former president of Nigeria who has, has made this case. No other continent in history has been tasked with the challenge of developing without polluting while simultaneously being the major victim and lowest contributor to emissions. So this is a very clear statement that allows us to put the context on our conversation today. And I'm, I'm delighted that we have a message from Mr. Franz Timmerman, the Vice President for the European Green Deal, who's going to, who answered a few questions for us by video. And we, he, we have three questions for him. The first thing we wanted to ask him was what was referenced um, uh, by the President um, from Senegal, who talked about the agreement in Glasgow which said that there is going to be a taxonomy and that a number of countries, including the EU, said they weren't going to finance fossil fuels. So we asked, Mr. Timmermans, the EU is filing, finalizing a taxonomy with its own member states, and that acknowledges the need for gas as a transition fuel in some specific circumstances and under limited conditions. Can this same accommodation be made for some African economies that need it the most to structurally transform? And will the EU financial and development institutions support it? 
The second question we asked him is, as we move towards the AU EU summit, how can we, Europe and Africa, work together to best ensure a shared approach to the any tree transition, which doesn't overlook the need, the basic need of access to energy for more than 600 million people in Africa who currently don't have access. And the third question we asked him is, do African economies need to align their engine energy transition paths with the EU Green Deal in order to benefit from financial support? So let's see his answers to those three questions. First of all, let me say that I'm really delighted to join President Sall in opening this EU-Africa high-level dialogue on climate and energy. Mr. President, I look forward to working with the African Union under your leadership. We have a lot to do over the coming years. We have huge challenges ahead of us, but also incredible opportunities. And I'm really excited that Africa and Europe, our two sister continents, decided to join forces on the most pressing issues of our time. The EU-Africa Summit is an opportunity for a renewed partnership between our two continents, a partnership based on shared interests and shared values. This is a decisive decade to prepare Africa and Europe for demographic changes, changing weather patterns, new global competition, and of course, a new economy. That is why green transition should be at the heart of our cooperation agenda for the next 10 years. Green investments are the only way we can deliver more jobs for African and European youth, more industrial growth alongside renewed and more equitable trade relations between the European Union and Africa. Yes, of course, we have different starting points. Africa contributes the least to global greenhouse gas emissions, and yet it is already suffering from the consequences of the climate crisis more than any other continent. You asked about the role of gas as a transitional fuel. And I want to be very clear. The EU considers gas as a bridge to climate neutrality, but only if it makes sense. When is that the case? If there is no other option, if it replaces coal, and if the investments made are hydrogen ready, because clean gases are the real answer for our future energy needs. Sure. In some places in Africa, gas will be part of the energy mix, and that is also part of the transition. But the world we live in today is simply not the same as the one we lived in 10 years ago. The last decade saw an incredible improvement in the competitiveness of solar and wind technologies, and a dramatic drop in prices. Within 10 years, the cost of solar energy fell by 85% onshore wind by 56% and offshore wind by 48%. Today, solar and wind energy continuously undercut even the cheapest new coal options, and they do so without needing state support. So let's be smart about this energy transition because Africa can be the biggest global winner. And this brings me to your second question, because it is a paradox that a continent which has the world's best sun and wind conditions is still suffering from energy poverty. Almost 600 million people in Africa live without access to electricity. And we all know how important energy access is for education, for healthcare, and industrial development. How do you run schools and hospitals or refrigerate vaccines if you don't have a stable connection to electricity? Electricity access is a top priority for the EU and for the European Green Deal. In the past years, the European Union and EU member states provided half of the development assistance for energy access projects in Africa. But we want to do more. Our new connectivity strategy, the Global Gateway, will leverage 300 billion euros for investments in transport, digital, climate and energy, health, as well as in education and research it is our offer to partner countries for sustainable and green infrastructure. The Commission will come to the summit next month with a concrete offer to support energy access in this crucial decade. With the Africa EU Green Energy Initiative, which we will launch next month, we want to focus on clean energy access. 
We also want to help build the right environment for private capital to support large-scale investments in renewables. This kind of cooperation is absolutely fundamental. The Green Deal is not about building a green fortress. It's about bringing others into the green growth. And I mean this as a response to your third question. Africa is ideally placed, both in terms of its natural resources and in terms of its geographic location, to enter the growing market for sustainable and higher value added uh, products. Think of green fertilizers or green steel and cement, which can be produced based on green hydrogen. And who has better conditions for producing cheap green hydrogen than Africa? To conclude, let me say a few words about our shared ambition to address the climate crisis. We can already see the crisis affecting weather patterns, causing disastrous floods and severe droughts, impacting people's health and crippling crucial sectors such as agriculture. The climate crisis is exacerbating national security issues as well, leading to political instability and displacement. This is already the reality we live in, and Africa is more impacted than anyone else. The good news is that the EU and Africa have a long-running experience in cooperating on climate resilience. But we are aware of the need to strike a better balance between mitigation and adaptation actions. This is why the EU pledged 100 million euros to the UN's Adaptation Fund at COP26, making the EU its biggest contributor. And the European Investment Bank launched its first dedicated adaptation plan to support adaptation projects around the world. The next climate COP, COP27, is coming back to Africa. So let's grasp this opportunity and let's create an even stronger alliance around African priorities, adaptation, loss and damage, climate finance. Together, we can go very, very far. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Vice President, Mr. Franz Timmerman, for you sharing the answers to these questions. Extremely helpful. I'd now like to pass the floor to Mr. Thierry Breton, the European Commissioner for Internal Market. Energy, as we've heard, is absolutely critical for industrial development and economic development. It's needed for healthcare, for education, etc. And both Europe and Africa have the goal of strategic autonomy. From your perspective as the European Commissioner for the Internal Market, how do you see Europe and Africa working together to strengthen their industrial capacities while undergoing both the green and the digital transitions? Well, thank you very much first uh, to, uh, to be together with you. And I would like to address, of course, uh, uh, myself to you and, uh, and first of all to uh, uh, Your Excellency, uh, President Macky Sall. Um, to you, of course, my dear friend, uh, uh, President uh, Charles Michel, Mo Ibrahim, and everyone. And if you don't mind, um, uh, I will. Uh, I mean, we may be a, a switch in uh, in French. Uh, I know there is a lot of French uh, speaking uh, um, uh, audience uh, here together with us uh, today. Uh, very quickly, I would like uh, to um, go over what has been said by uh, His Excellency President Macky Sall, by President Charles Michel, and by my friend, Franz Timmermans. First of all, uh, there are priorities and the discussion for the summit. I know that uh, President uh, Macky Sall is uh, well preparing himself for that summit. President uh, Charles Michel has also referred to his uh, uh, key and personal commitment for himself, for all of us, for Europe, to, to about vaccines. It is uh, essential. President Macky Sall has uh, reminded us about this. We are still in the pandemic. We need to do more. Uh, we stand for the, 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 uh, the Novak vaccine. And uh, of course, we need to have a look at the industrial vaccine policy in Europe. Uh, I want to tell you that we will be there. We will play a key role. We will uh, bring the uh, required assistance for that important uh, uh, matter. Many initiatives, well, some initiatives have already been taken in Senegal, in Rwanda, in Uganda, and in South Africa in order to set up uh, facilities. Uh, other initiatives uh, will be uh, needed, of course. 
I would also like to uh, welcome the uh, efforts uh, made by Priscilla about the uh, COVAX. Now, a few words, two things about the energy. And I would like to use the words of President Macky Sall, because actually that we take the right inspiration from him. Uh, for uh, for that uh, big meeting, uh, gathering that will take place between uh, the European Union and uh, Africa in February. Our position, our stance uh, in Europe, speaking here under the control of Charles Michel, is that we are here, as has been said, to work together, but our future is uh, uh, connected, is interconnected, is intertwined. They can't be a European success without an African success and vice versa. And we all know that, of course, we need to uh, materialize all this. And uh, the first thing to do is to listen, to listen to the needs of the African continent. President Macky Sall said it. The needs have been clearly identified. The stakes are key. Uh, they are not easy. These are difficult challenges for the youth as well. And uh, the first thing is to listen uh, to uh, to you, to your requests. And we are going to listen to you about your needs in energy, because the energy needs are huge. And as you've said, Macky Sell, we need to build together a common strategy in the field of energy, of decarbonized energy. We need to go along the same pathway. Uh, but for this, we first need to well assess the needs. We know that uh, there will be increasing electricity needs, uh, significant needs in Europe uh, for our zero carbon objective. Uh, um, we know that we probably have to produce to, to double the production of electricity in Europe uh, before 2050. So that's significant. That's huge. On the African continent, well, you already have your make, made your own estimates, and it's very important to go over them. And uh, we will, of course, uh, be ready to take part in discussion, to talk about the estimates, to anticipate, and we'll probably have to uh, triple the production capacity in Africa, or um, if, if we want to uh, achieve uh, the uh, objective that we have set uh, ourselves. Uh, um, at the COP in uh, Glasgow, among others. So who knows, maybe there will be a need of 100 billion euros per year just for the electrification of the whole of the African continent. And as President Makisel said it, so that means there must be uh, investments, there must be funds, there must be access to funds, and that also requires involvement of all the companies that will uh, play a role into this. So that also means that uh, Technological innovations will be needed. Franz Herman talked about this, about renewable energies. We know we're going to go on renewing, innovating. We know that uh, uh, we will uh, uh, have uh, less expensive facilities that are more adapted to the needs. So we've referred to the solar energy, renewable energies, and everything relating to the wind energy. There will probably be other. Um, energy. So but we we need to have a roadmap. We should not fear technological innovation. We'll have to innovate. We'll have together to build transition pathways. Otherwise, uh, uh, there will be no solution. And the last thing about the industrial uh, capacities. Oh. The more we look at things, the more we have a better idea uh, about what we had before the crisis. The globalization is uh, radically changing with the pandemic. We all know that. And we focus more and more on uh, value chains that make up all the industrial segments that make the industrial power of a continent, be it the African continent or the European one. And we need to look at all the components of the value chains. We need to work together with trusted partners, reliable partners. And about this, uh, uh, Africa is a, a, a priority, the right uh, partner, given the material, the raw materials. But there will be other components intervening, industrial components uh, needed for different sectors, the uh, car industry, uh, uh, for the mobility uh, uh, sector transport sector. So we, that is 
uh, also something we need to talk about and we need to discuss this and we're fully ready to uh, go over this at the next summit. And the last uh, point, now we'll end with this, everything relating to the digitization. This is key for us in Europe. Uh, uh, in parallel with the green transition, there is the digital transition, and this is of paramount importance for the African continent as well. So we have joint projects in the field of digitization. There are uh, uh, projects uh, that will allow us uh, to uh, propose uh, connectivity uh, on the African continent, uh, and these are indeed uh, uh, matters for the future. and. Uh, we once again are ready to work hand in hand with the African continent under the presidency of uh, the President uh, Makisel. So this is all I wanted to tell you. Thank you for your commitment. Uh, thank you, uh, President Makisel. Thank you to uh, 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 Franz Timmermans. Thank you. To build a pathway together for both continents and the importance of finding reliable partnerships that to be able to work on the value chains. We've now finished this first exchange of our political leadership, so now we're going to bring in some different experts that will help us focus in on this issue of energy and climate. And I'm going to in invite them to speak very briefly, just have two minutes each, so we can keep the conversation flowing. And the first person I'd like to introduce is Damilola Ogumbiyi, who is the Special Representative of the UN Secretary General for Sustainable Energy for All, the co-chair of UN Energy and the former um, CEO of the Agency for Rural Electrification. And as I introduce you, I just want us to show a few facts and figures that really highlight what we're talking about in terms of access. We've had it mentioned a couple of times, there's 600 million people in Africa who lack access to energy. And without that, we have problems with education, with uh, economic development, with agriculture and everything. So there's an enormous challenge there that it's almost half of the population are off grid. So this has really got to be key. And this is something you understand from your, your former post of being responsible for rural electrification. How do you see this balance between the importance of the primal need of getting energy access and then as several of our speakers before talked about the transition and decarbonisation? What are the implications of a just transition for Africa's gas reserves, which are quite extensive? Should these resources stay in the ground, which many climate campaigners say, leave the climate, the, the fossil fuels in the ground? Or over what time frame might they offer a valuable means to bring access and transition together? So can you help us balance out this issue of getting access to people who need it, also building a path outwards, a transition to a clean fuel, and the fact that Africa has these tremendous gas resources that it could use. A challenge, Damilola, but I'm sure you're up to it. Thank you very much. I think some figures that you don't have there is the fact that you don't, not having electrification and not having for clean cooking for many Africans, especially in sub-Saharan Africa, is about 10 million deaths every single year. And these are just facts by not having what people in Europe and myself in New York take for granted. The other figures you don't have is almost a billion people in sub-Saharan Africa don't have access to clean cooking. And that kills about 4 million women a year. So if we look at it and take that lens and take the urgency, the conversation isn't about gas or no gas. The conversation is what is the clean energy transition and the need of energy access. If we do not have the African population with affordable and reliable electrification by 20 cannot achieve our climate goals. This brings me to the key things we've heard today, especially from His Excellency President Mackey. We're talking about um, asking countries to go on energy transition. That's a full electrification of the entire economy. When these countries still want to achieve access, want to um, achieve industrialization and just a better future for their people. For that to happen, gas has to be part of the transition. Um, we did, a, we did a, a study in Nigeria alone, and this is the largest in Africa. Nigeria will need about $1.5 trillion to achieve net zero by 2060. And 400 billion of that is business as usual spending. Currently, for the whole sub Saharan Africa, you have barely 4 billion of investment going into energy now. And this is the clean energy that we are all trying to get through. So I just want you to, to understand the, the scope of that. 
and for Nigeria to integrate the amount of renewables needed to achieve energy transition, it has to do 10x the amount of gas it's currently supplying. So it's 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 not one or the other, right? Mm. We we have to supply adequate clean cooking. We have to supply gas to integrate as base load for renewables. Renewables don't just happen magically. And there's, so there's a lot of misconception about that, but it has to be part of a plan. It has to be part of an energy transition plan. So we all know that we're going cleaner. The Again, Sub-Saharan Africa, if you take away South, South Africa, responsible for merely 0.55% of global emission. That means if everybody was powered by gas, which isn't what we're trying to achieve at all, it would go up by 1.6% to, to to get people out of energy poverty. Is this something we are saying as a global audience we cannot do? So I'm 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 against people saying they're not funding any fossil at all of which gas is part of. I'm I'm for people saying we will fund projects as long as it's part of an energy transition plan and you see a pathway to net zero. And that is really what we have to do. I think if some people go on ground and just see the emergency and also the talent that we're stifling because we're not providing energy for the youth they will understand that this this you know the fact that we're still having conversations about this instead of what we should be saying is how much is going in how much is going into the private sector how much is going into evs how much is going to clean energy how much is going to the gas we're using to integrate it those are the conversations we really really need to have because we're at a emergency now it's it's crisis point energy access Thank you, Damalola. And as you say, you very urgent calls. You've highlighted the number of people who are dying and that this is something we really need to get to grips with. Let me bring in Laurence Tubiana, for the CEO from the European Climate Foundation. We've just heard that, yes, the EU would consider gas as part of a transition under certain conditions. So f from your perspective, what are the conditions under which the revised taxonomy for gas might be acceptable in an EU setting? And what would be the consequences for the African context. <clears throat> uh, thank you, and thank you for this invitation for a fascinating discussion that I think I hope between so so civil society governments and academic institutions that has to continue between our two continents because we need really frank discussion as President Mo Ibrahim has, has called for. Um, in principle, gas has no, no, no place, really no role in the taxonomy of green investment. And, uh, and the acceptable condition that were set in the in initially uh, set a threshold for energy project that is 100 grams for CO2 equivalent uh, per kilowatt. Uh, of course, that is because of the carbon budget that the EU has decided to conform with, and of course, the net zero uh, perspective for 2050. Uh, so, all this investment, all the trajectory of the energy transition plan has to fill in that carbon budget. So uh, the discussion outside, nowadays, of course, is, is trying to find uh, a compromise between a different number of countries uh, that, and that's what the commission proposal is about, uh, to consider and to limit in a way uh, by the time and the level of, and the, you know, as a content of carbon uh, for this gas investment, but really say that by 2030, uh, that will be uh, that will be over. That uh, this taxonomy could include this gas investment. Uh, the thresholds, of course, on CO2 per kilowatt uh, are, are, of course, a concern. What are the consequences for Africa on that? One, I think I, I, I totally understand the call for consistency between, uh, you know, what uh, Europe is doing and when, in a way, what the, the condition of cooperation could be. And I understand perfectly our colleagues in Africa saying, you, you are using still a lot of coal, you are still using a lot of gas. So what is the, the consistency with, with the conversation going on with Africa? That's why I totally agree with Damilola, the energy transition plan has to be discussed together and there has to be support for this perspective of how Africa together with Europe will really uh, be fulfilling the Paris Agreement goals. And for that reason, I think we are in facing a an extraordinary period with uh, such this industrial revolution we are all all all, uh, all, all uh, of us embarking in and so i do think that uh, um, the for the reason of climate justice we should have really a, a, a eu being consistent and in particular a preparation for the cop uh, in charmel share 
on the real support of you know each country in africa energy transition every country no there is no silver bullet no size fits all everyone has his particular resources and the potential of, of uh, developing them and that's why Af uh, eu has to support this plan but of course that's the beginning of the discussion we have talked a lot about the south africa plan and uh, we can discuss all, all of these components but the value was uh, South Africa has developed its own plan with its own constituencies and present that to the donors' countries, international finance, private capital, just to support that. I was very sensitive to the problem of the cost of capital that President Makisal uh, mentioned uh, with these uh, numbers of 7 or 8 percent with a um, maturity of 10 years, you don't do investment in energy, in access to energy, where we need a huge investment in grid to have really access to energy to everyone. So I do think that the constraint that EU has to put on itself and to be consistent, but has to offer at the same time, really a, a sound discussion on the energy transition to the low carbon economy that every everybody would, would have to go for. And again, don't forget the economic opportunity, the business opportunity, and the capacity, of course, of this continent, and in particular Africa, really to uh, to really have this trade potential vis-a-vis uh, -vis Europe, and in particular, as Commissaire Thierry Breton said, there is a wonderful economic opportunity for Africa to go in the green direction, but Excellent. based on your the discussion on their own countries, on what their energy transition wants to look like. Thank you very much. This is, again, giving us this, uh, the framework that you know, national countries need to find their own energy plan as part of a bigger section. And I've, I've taken your point, there's no silver bullet, no one size fits all. We need to have an energy transition plan. And we've got several people putting messages in the chat, highlighting and welcoming the messages from uh, Damilola about just how many people, particularly women and children, are harmed by the lack of access to energy there. Uh, we have shortened lives um, and deaths from poor, cooking fuels and others. We have their educational chances and their economic development that is blighted. This is a real emergency that needs to be dealt with and many people in the chat recognizing that. When we look forward to the next COP, COP27, countries will need to review their nationally determined commitments. And this is an opportunity to set out exactly what many of you have been talking about, which is to have a clear plan. Yes, there's a transition to a decarbonized economy, but we also need to meet urgent needs now. And I'm going to pick up and with our next speaker, I'm going to invite Benedict Oke Orama, the president of the Afri uh, Exim Bank, to comment next because several speakers, including President Sal, have talked about the amount of money that would be needed to be invested in the electrification process and in the energy access. So, uh, Mr. Orama, let me ask you, what's the energy investment pathway that makes sense for Africa? making sure that efforts towards energy transition do not impede actions to increase access to energy for those who are currently off the grid and vice versa. Can we find an investment pathways that does both at the same time? Thank you very much. And let me, oh. thank you very much. And let me, uh, my respects to His Excellency President Makisal and President Michel. Uh, the way we see it is uh, that today, Africa, which accounts for a uh, global population of about 17%, only emits just about 4% about of the global CO2. So what that tells me is that Africa can disappear from the face, uh, uh, the face of the earth and the problem of climate will remain. Uh, Africa is rather um, a victim of the problem of climate change rather than the cause of climate change. So what we need uh, to do uh, is to find solution to what climate change and other things are causing to the continent. Poverty is the biggest threat that is facing Africa today. And, and poverty is also the biggest threat to climate 
in Africa. It is not the pursuit of access to energy because we do not have any access. If what the figures say is that if we want to um, attain the sustainable development goals for Africa, we need uh, to double generation by 2030 and increase it by fivefold by 2050. For net zero, we need $2.8 trillion. All these cost so much money. And if we do not deal with the issue of poverty, we will open many problems. Deforestation will come. Countries will go into upheaval. And the financing that has been cut to fossil fuel is something that can lead to all of this. Some about one third of African countries depend on fossil fuel for their foreign exchange revenues, fiscal revenues, and a sig significant portion of employment. So if you just cut financing to all of this, you are going to see many countries go up in flames. It is a stable country that can pursue climate, uh, uh, climate resilience. So what we think has to happen is that Africa itself has to begin to design the financing mechanisms that will help you to achieve net zero, that help you to transit towards that net zero. And we think that will happen by making sure we maintain sensible financing of fossil fuel, while also taking advantage of the opportunities that the, the uh, climate issues today present to the continent because there are issues, there are opportunities we see in solar, there are opportunities we see in batteries given the natural resources we have on the continent. And that's what our present bank is doing, uh, trying to help the continent to, to design a, a financing mechanism that can lead to a, a sensible transition to net zero. Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, for sharing that view and uh, highlighting the importance of the financing. And I'm now going to invite Ambroise uh, Fayol, who's the Vice President of the European Investment Bank, because we're still very much focusing on the investments that are needed and how finance can be mobilised for this. So the EIB is a signatory to that agreement that came out of COP26 in Glasgow not to finance fossil fuels. So when we look at this urgent need that's been expressed so eloquently by several of our speakers about increasing access to energy in Africa and addressing energy poverty, what can you finance? What are the realistic tools that could meet these targets in the short term? Thank you very much, and thanks a lot for the for the invitation to uh, to EIB. As as you know, EIB is the the bank of the European Union. Uh, we finance projects that uh, that are of uh, of uh, great interest to the European Union, and of course, uh, we are transforming ourselves into becoming the EU climate bank. Uh, and uh, and we are very active in um, in Africa, so that's uh, that's that's why also I. We, we we take this uh, these meetings as as extremely extremely valuable for uh, for us to, uh, to listen and to learn more from uh, from our our African friends. Um, I I would say the, the following: we have been active quite uh, significantly in terms of financing uh, climate projects in 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 Africa, uh, given the need to uh, to strengthen the, the way to uh, universal access. Uh, to energy, and uh, we've done that um, in in many ways, combining often uh, infrastructure uh, needs and uh, and 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 more, you know, uh, solar plants uh, or, or or water projects or, um, uh, or or wind turbines, like in like in Lake Turkana or like in Gambia, where we have financed uh, a, a, a big. Uh, a big project that uh, that has uh, that have really changed the network of uh, of uh, of energy, and what I would say is the lessons that we that we the challenges that we that we think are uh, I would list just just list three of them uh, in in financing the the the, the projects of 
increasing access to, uh, to energy. The first one is one that uh, Vice President Tim Moments has referred to, which is the uh, massive uh, need to support more infrastructure resilience in, in Africa, and this including in the energy sector. And of course, this is linked to the question of adaptation. Uh, and uh, we at, uh, at EIB, we have committed in Glasgow to triple our, um, our share of uh, projects that are financing adaptation uh, by 2025 uh, compared with the situation now. So it's a big, uh, it's a big, uh, big commitment. Uh, the second thing that, uh, that, that, that we know is that, of course, public investments, we are a public bank, are very, uh, are very important. Uh, but we need also to, uh, to try to, uh, to make sure that the private sector uh, is participating as much as possible and, and to maximize that. Mm -hmm. And for that, what we see is uh, the need to, uh, uh, to find the right instruments, the right partnerships, and the right uh, enabling environment. And finally, and that's, that's, that's the, the third point that I would like to stress, uh, what, we, what we think also is that we need to, uh, to um, reinforce the focus on access to energy through decentralized energy production, through, for example, midi grids, through solar home systems, uh, combined with storage. I mean, given the characteristics of this, uh, these projects and also the last mile connection that is also very important, uh, these are investments that we think should attract also the private and private sector and also including the local one. And so when when you take that into um, in, into consideration, what what we have the, the feeling at EIB is that we need to do much more on, on blending. Um, we need to do much more on combining the the resources of uh, of uh, of public and private sector to lower the cost of capital, as the President Sal said. Uh, and also, uh, it uh, would also be good for customers because uh, that uh, and and that would probably be without market uh, distortion. Uh, and we need to uh, do much more in terms of project preparation, uh, in terms of doing more upstream to uh, to, uh, to that together to uh, to try to develop the number of projects that are that are needed. Okay. So I, I'll stop there. Uh, but um, we think that uh, with uh, uh, with the global getaway, with the global Europe, with the team Europe, you have uh, you have the financial means in Europe to support these projects, and uh, you can count on EIB to be part of it. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Amboise, for sharing your views and perspectives. Let me now uh, invite Vera Songwe, the Executive Secretary for the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa, to, to come in on this point, because we've heard how reliable and universally accessible energy is absolutely critical for economic development. So for you, in your view, what are the options for African countries to develop plans for broader access and energy transition pathways that meets both their economic and their energy needs. Thank you, and let me start by acknowledging, uh, first of all, President Makisar, of course, President Michel, and the Commissioner uh, for Energy in Europe. And uh, Energy is an equalizer, and I think that this conversation today is a conversation about how we are making energy an inequalizer by saying we're going to say to Africa, don't use some of your energy to get to a prosperous continent. And that's, at the end of the day, what we are trying to get to, is get jobs for every young African, as President Makisal has said. And let me just give you two examples. In November 2021, all of Europe was scared because gas prices had quadrupled, because gas was short. The reason gas was short was because you had only stored 56% of the gas you normally store to use during winter. And so there was a huge crisis in Europe. And we opened the gas markets from Russia, and the Europeans started using gas. Off the shores of Mozambique, where we have a crisis today, and where Mozambique's growth is plummeting, we are still uh, exploiting gas for Europe's consumption. How do you feel, if you were a Mozambican, who does not have access to energy, and only 17% do, seeing you know, European companies continuing to exploit gas to take to Europe, where gas is still needed, and saying to Africans, you cannot use gas. I think it's impossible. Mm -hmm. President Makisal didn't say that, but let me just give you an example. Before President Makisal and Senegal and Mauritania and the 23 other countries on the continent uh, that are exploiting gas discovered gas, he was using heavy fuel oil with oil imported from European countries at about 32 cents per kilowatt. 
With gas, we can actually reduce the cost of energy, ensure that you get more investment. And so again, gas for Africa is not a question of whether we're going to do climate change or not. And we actually see that when we produce more gas, we actually reduce the consumption and our production of carbon emissions by almost 38%. With gas production, President Makisal can actually increase his solar energy and his wind capacity. And I think we do not need to look at that in a just transition uh, 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 mentality. Now, I, wor I worry a little bit when Africa waits for Europe to come and tell us what kind of gas they will fund. I, I think this is the beginning of the conversation. It has to be that Europe and Africa, and I hope President Makisal, as we prepare for the EU-Africa conversation, says, let's work together to say what kind of gas you're going to, 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 to use. Because if we wait for, for, for Europe to come and tell us this is what we're going to do, it's not going to work because it will clearly be something that doesn't push us. I think as we were listening to Monsieur Thierry Breton, he talked a lot about fertilizer. All of the fertilizer in the world today is produced by gas-powered engines. We talked about chemicals. A lot of the chemical production in the world is done by gas-powered factories. So there is no way that we can talk about gas and say, stop doing gas, but Africa can do fertilizer because Africa has a lot of it. We must have that full picture as we go forward. And I think this is the conversation today is Africa, like Europe, like the United States, we have the information, we're running the models with Damilola and many others, and we can see those conversations. That is what a just transition means. A just transition means that we phase in the use of gas or phase out the use of coal as we replace it with something that creates jobs. And finally, I think this conversation also needs to talk about carbon pricing. Today, as President Makisal talked about migration, if we were able to put a price to carbon, and this was one of the big failures of COP26, is we need to put a price to carbon. With a price to carbon, we can actually create 160 million jobs on the continent. So I think this is a conversation we must have as well. And I hope again, uh, President Makisal, as you chair the conversations in, in Europe on, this, on, on the issue of gas and pricing of carbon, we bring this issue up because if we keep our forest, our forest will create jobs for our youth and we will be much, much better off. At 10 tons of carbon, we can create 40 million jobs. At 120 tons of carbon, we can create 167 million jobs on the continent. These are the numbers that we're talking about and this is how we begin to talk about a just transition, a prosperous Africa, and an Africa that becomes, I think, part of the global community and helps with climate change and, and improving sustainability. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Vera, for sharing your perspectives and making some very clear points and important for us to look at it in that perspective from an equity and planning perspective. Let me now invite uh, Uzo Uwela, <coughs> who is the CEO of the African Centre, to share some perspective. Now, what's your take on what you've just heard? We've had someone in the chat who's mentioned this is, seems to be a conversation for people who, 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 who want gas or who say it shouldn't be done, but where's the, the role for energy efficiency? Where's the role for financing? Uzo, can I invite you to just give us a short two-minute overview of what your takeaway is of the conversation so far? Sure. Uh, thank you very much. And um, uh, it's, it's great to be here. And also, um, uh, my regards to the president of Senegal and also the president of the EU Commission. I think I just want to say this, that, that one of the things I'm hearing, yes, it is a discussion about um, energy transition. It's a discussion about gas versus no gas. But I, I think the thing here... Um, to really think about is is to really call out, I think, in many ways, and this is what I've written about, the hypocrisy of the statement of people who are are still funding gas in their own countries, funding sort of like dirty energy, if we'll call it that, projects in their own countries, and asking other folks to not do that so that they can maintain or enhance the lifestyles that they live uh, while other folks are not able to do that. You know, we've heard a lot about the, the need for energy access to move from um, poverty into, into you know, or move out of poverty, right? And I think that's a really important thing to say and to put, um, to just be very concrete about. And I think, you know, it's been said in different forms by some of the different speakers, but I just want to highlight that, that you cannot ask the continent of Africa, and I've said this before, to carbon finance the lifestyles of wealthier nations. Um, it doesn't work, right? And it fits a pattern um, of behavior, I think, from some of these uh, wealthier countries that has been the case from the very, very beginning. And, you know, I can say that because I'm not a politician, I'm not somebody who runs a big institution, but I think it's really important to just hone in on that fact. And I think that, you know, like you hear tones of that from some of the folks from the European side, 
where there is this idea that you know we should be able to control and dictate um, uh, how this how this transition happens. And I think on the side of uh, you know if we're we're seeing their sides from the African side, you know the pushback I think is is very strong and, and incredibly important. And the answer to that is no. Like this is a global problem. This is a situation about justice and equity. And this is a situation in which um, we all need to sit down and really think about what kind of lives do we want to live in the future. I mean, if you want to keep your lifestyle um, going, but at the expense of someone else, it's going to catch up. We're seeing it catch up with us right now. And I think that's the main point that I would like to drive home. That like you cannot have. Um, the life that you want to live um, and ask other people to pay for it. It works for a little bit, but it won't work permanently. And we're in a situation where we have to act now. I think that's the main point. But in terms of all the technical things that people have said, you know, like, I think it's all out there. The experts have, have, have shown exactly what it is that we, we need to do in terms of the transition and spoken to how we can do that. And I think we should listen. Excellent. Thank you so much, Uzo. Let me invite uh, Tanya Gonner for the chair of the management board at the uh, GIZ to also share the, a very short perspective on what you've just heard and what your main takeaway is of the, the state of the conversation. Well, thank you so much um, uh, for this uh, question, um, Excellency President Imaki Sal, um, President Michel, dear distinguished panelists. Um, First of all, I would like to say 2022 is going to be a crucial year for the European African partnership. But also 2022 is a key for climate and energy. Uh, we need to ensure that the conclusion of last year's COP26 in Glasgow become a reality by reducing our CO2 emissions to remain under the 1.5 degree target. We also need to make our countries more resilient to the impacts of climate change. And at the same time, we need to respond to the increasing energy demand to power sustainable agri-food system and social uh, social economic development. And please, if we discussed about access to energy, then I'm pretty convinced that we are much faster with uh, decentralized off-grid systems than discussing about very huge um, 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 uh, 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 other uh, things. We have to respond to the energy needs of the African continent in a sustainable green way. It is more than ever, I think, a time for action. But let me start with a, a, an also with an optimistic note. Technical and economic solutions exist for Africa to leapfrog into a green, resilient and prosperous future. Clean energy technologies are becoming cheaper. The solar revolution is well underway. Mr. Timmermans mentioned it before. And we are not starting from scratch. For example, we as GIZ can build on a long history of successful cooperation with Africa on climate and energy. Currently, we support energy sector transformations in 26 African countries with a financial volume of more than 300 million euros. And I think as European Union, we are also moving into the right direction. The Team Europe approach makes us work better together. What we need now is to walk the talk because the question of a climate and energy is so complex there is no one size fits all mm -hmm. solution one thing is sure for me as development partners we need to act in more coordinated way the individual patchwork project approach is not enough we have to work differently to be more systematic and coherent and to think out of box and we should join the forces with other uh, actors as we uh, are discussing here um, uh, uh, today on this panel with financial institutions, with public and private sectors, but also universities, local, regional, national and international actors, not forgetting civil society and grassroots organizations. And let me give one example. The Just Transition Partnership, the Just Energy Transition Partnership is a good example of this innovative way of thinking and doing. It aims to supporting South Africa to accelerate its transition to a low emission climate resilient development over the next 20 years. The governments of South Africa, France, Germany, the United Kingdom and the United States and also along with the European Union will provide financial and technical support. And that means that we have to implement this uh, initiative to show mm -hmm. how it could, uh, how action could uh, work. And if we want to renew the partnership between 
Africa and Europe, we also need the political engine, a forum where the two continents discuss and align their strategic visions and jointly push for action. And I saw in the right. chat there are also colleagues from the Africa-EU Energy Partnership. Uh, that provides a robust mechanism for political dialogue between Africa and the EU. And I think this is extremely keen to help transform the political and policy decisions into concrete action because we have to come into uh, concrete action. And so I think today's uh, discussion will, I'm sure, nourish Great. for the thinking. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Tanya, for sharing that perspective. Let me now um, turn to the next person I'm going to bring in. That's Wanjira Matai, the Vice President and Director for Africa at the World Resources Institute. We've had lots of comments in the chat highlighting the, the connections that were made uh, by President Macky Sall at the beginning at the link between poverty, about climate change, migration, the need to bring civil society on board and to have a bottom-up approach and the, the role of teachers and education in addressing the, the pathway to an energy transition. But uh, Wanjira, let me invite you to just give us a short two-minute perspective from your side about the just energy transition. What is that narrative for Africa? Thank you very much. President Maki Sal, Excellencies, friends, um, Africa's role in the energy transition, as we've heard from so many of the previous speakers to low carbon economies is undeniable as a major source of minerals, precious metals, central to the green technology, and at the, at, at the least electrified of the fastest growing continent on the globe, and one of the regions of the world that is actually most in need of investment in resiliency and, and, and extremely vulnerable because of climate. These are the issues we have to remember. In fact, because of how many of these multiple issues are compounding in real time, we know that by 2050, Africa will be the Earth's most populous continent. 80% of the world's poor will be resident in Africa. 90% of those left behind because of lack of energy. This is, these are the issues, and as Dami Lola pointed out, those issues are resulting in less. This is in, in deaths. This is simply unsustainable. So no one can be left behind in a truly sustainable future. So to address these contradictions through the principles of fair participation, fair distribution, fair compensation is really what the just transition, the just energy transition is trying to address. Many activists, African activists, youth groups, trade unions, civil society, everyone is now really deeply engaged in defining what this just transition looks like for Africa. So for instance, what does it mean politically to develop and implement a just transition agenda in Africa's hydrocarbon, agriculture, and mining dependent economies? How do we even pursue and recognize and even measure just in Africa? How can our partners in the West, those friends like all of you here, ensure that their development work is consistent with our local visions mm -hmm. for just justice in this transition? These are some of the important questions we have to ask and answer, because there is always a risk, always a risk of poorly defined concepts driving the African agenda, creating space for convenient rhetoric, unfortunately, that is co-opted and turned into false solutions. And ultimately, they do not benefit uh, the people they intend to benefit, and those are our local communities. For instance, is it just, is it just, if we all ask ourselves, for global industries to decarbonize in the name of the green economy while remaining profitable through continued exploitation of workers in vulnerable countries. These types of incomplete actions widen the inequality divide rather than closing it. And then they ensure that the full circular solutions actually are in place to address them. So for Africa, I'll say, as previous speakers have indicated, and certainly President Sal in his opening remarks, this continent is poised on the cusp of a major industrial growth and expansion and it needs a major boost in its energy supply to address the lack of basic energy access that we've heard about already. We have to think about the future of our energy systems extremely carefully. Yep. We need clear country, regional, and Pan-African positions on key issues, such as how to deal with near-term coal investment opportunities, the role of transition fuels like gas, as we've heard, 
So all of these issues and climate justice, job displacement are going to have to come into place. So our friends in Europe are critical partners in getting this right. And there are three ways we think. One, we need your support in creating the space for a local dialogue, local research to establish community-driven consensus-built principles for just transitions. We need you to lift, amplify, and prioritize African voices and perspectives. Mm -hmm. We also need the support on finance so that we can invest in the huge opportunities for jobs, economic growth, security, and closing the energy access gap in sub-Saharan Africa, as we heard, for Nigeria alone is a huge, huge lift. And so, uh, and we need you, of course, to act on commitments. The recently concluded COP delivered a barrage of pledges for energy transition, both in power generation and industry, but we need to see those actually come to pass. We hear the right words all the time, yes. but sadly, as we heard from Franz Timmermans, he says that we can go far together. Well, we've been together, and together we have not gone that far. So hopefully we can turn that around, especially at COP27 as it comes to Africa, when global attention will be placed on the issues that matter around adaptation, loss and damage, and the just transition. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Wanjira. And Mary Robinson, let me bring you in because you, you've, um, former Prime Minister of Ireland and the co-honorary president of the Africa Europe Foundation, climate justice has been at the heart of your work for a decade. And we've just had this very strong message from Wanjira talking about how to amplify voices from Africa, listen to them, to act on commitments and provide appropriate finances. What would you like to add on this, this strong call for climate justice? Thank you very much. Uh, I think a climate justice approach basically is a people-centered approach. And I think this has been a more honest conversation between those who've spoken from a European perspective and from an African perspective than we often have. So we're moving in the right direction. We're beginning to listen to each other. We're beginning to understand that there are real differences. And when we come to just transition, I think it's really important. Access to energy is all about just transition. And the just transition applies to both continents. But the just transition in Europe should be much faster into clean energy and out of fossil fuel. There's no doubt about that. It has the capacity to, it has the responsibility to. It's been a big emitter. So a different standard. The just transition of access to energy in, in Africa, as has been said, is, is, is at the two levels. Is at the level of um, uh, industry, manufacturing, etc., that African countries want to do. But it's also at the level of the household. Um, the fact that there is energy poverty and even that number, uh, the, the, you know, the huge number of women who don't have access uh, to clean cooking, um, almost a, a billion people, a million people. Um, it, it, it's really very um, striking and, and that point has already been made. So um, we, we've discussed this in the Women Leaders Network that Ellen Johnson Sirleaf and myself co-host and we've come to really good agreement on this that, you know, we do need gas in Africa as, and in, in Europe in certain ways as a transition out in order to, get, to transition into clean energy. So we need criteria of saying how, for how long and in what context, and it will be different in both continents and different in different countries. But that, that's the conversation we're having. I believe it's also very important. I want to make two other points. Um, I'd like to see the EU and the, and the African Union operationalize the COP26 outcomes in the EU-Africa partnership. It means cooperating more closely on climate diplomacy and specifically um, uh, I'd like to see the possibility of um, uh, really mobilizing around loss and damage and a facility for loss and damage in the COP, in COP27 in Africa. I'd like to see African countries row in behind the Egyptian uh, presidency and make it a real African COP with clear ideas from the continent that uh, really hold sway and allow the voices of those who are frontline, who are indigenous, who are women, who are um, uh, building resilience in their communities, showing the difference that is made, that their voices are heard. And finally, uh, I, I, I support the idea um, of the EU using its own uh, diplomacy. Um, it, you know, the EU is the you know, it's collectively the largest shareholder in the IMF and the World Bank, and so can help drive much needed reforms there, and in particular, um, mobilize finance 
a key priority for African countries. Um, I'd like to see Team Europe take the lead in alloc on allocating special drawing rights, SDRs. Um, the African Union is asking for 100 billion in SDRs so they can respond to the economic fallout from the pandemic and climate change. And then the final point is to see the EU support a proposal for the G20 to become the G21 with the African Union as a member. It does seem absolutely vital that the African Union, like the EU, would be a member of the, uh, of the G20 going forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mary. And, and you, you chaired earlier this week a meeting of the Women's Leaders Network, which discussed some of this issue. We had some great input from very senior leadership from the IMF, uh, the UN and other agencies that explored exactly this issue of climate justice and the energy transition, how important that is for women. In a few moments, I'm going to be bringing back His Excellency uh, President Macky Sall. But before we do that, let me ask Kande Yumkela, who is the co-chair of our Africa Europe Strategy Group, to just just reflected just in one or two minutes on, on how our conversation has moved the ideas forward. Candy. Merci beaucoup. Thank you. First of all, I would like to thank all the experts that have made relevant uh, contributions. And I think we can uh, admit that all agree that uh, Africa is not well known. That the, even if Africa was, were to disappear, the climate issue would still be at stake. So we need to keep things in the right proportions. And I would like to make a reminder about a principle. There can't be economic development without electricity. But to have competitive electricity, low-cost electricity, there must be a source, a basic source. And for Europe, for North America, for China, um, it's been coal, it's been the nuclear energy. And we could uh, add gas as a basic source that works at guarantees a, an ongoing production at a low cost. Then we could add uh, wind energy, solar energy, hydrogen, hydroelectricity. But first, there must be some basic energy for Africa to allow Africa to economically develop to uh, allow for an economic development for Africa. So this is key in our discussions, in, our, in the debates. Uh, to take into account of the energy needs of Africa uh, must not be, cannot be questioned. And we need to agree on this. And if Europe aims at doubling its production uh, at the horizon of 2050, the African production is so low. We usually make a caricature. We say that the Manhattan Island has more, produces more energy than the whole of the African continent. And these are the proportions. Out of the 54 African countries, 20 to 30 of them do not consume 500 megawatts. Uh, the biggest consumers uh, do not go over the 2,000 megawatts. So we're talking about quite modest uh, situation. So we sh should bring things back into the right proportions. So uh, the African continent shouldn't have a bad conscience about climate. It wouldn't be fair. We are not the one who pollute. We are not the polluters. We are part of... Uh, uh, alternative solutions to preserve our common habitat, to preserve the earth. And we are very good pupils. Many African countries have more than go beyond 20 percent, whereas in Senegal it was set by Paris Agreement. And uh, in Senegal, there are 31 percent of uh, renewable energies, solar energy, wind energy. So Africa has to be supported. 
since the summit of Paris, uh, it's been difficult uh, to use the 100 billion that have been uh, decided to haven't received them yet. So saying that they're going to uh, give more resources, uh, well, let's wait and see. I'm like St. Thomas. Uh, I believe uh, what I see only. So I think that with the will of Europe, with the will of Africa, we can build essential things. We can build key things about the climate, about the facilities. There is a major need of facilities in Africa. Africa wants to be in a position to transfer products without water, without energy. There can't be any relevant economic trade in Africa uh, without the right facilities. Many partners are ready to fund these facilities, but this is the um, issue uh, that Africa has to cope with for the moment, the building, the construction of uh, transport ways, railways, airports, roads. This is why I, uh, I welcome the uh, global gateway. I fully welcome, appreciate that European initiative that will respond to concrete questions, to concrete issues, the issue of infrastructures, of facilities. We initiated more than 11, year, uh, 11 years ago the building of the Green Wall. And Everybody now uh, uses that, that example of uh, the green wall to use renewable energies to, ref to do reforestation. So Africa has concrete solutions to the concrete problem that it is faced with. And I'm sure that Africans and Europeans together will be a winning team, <laughs> uh, will be something reliable for everyone, will play a key role to solve the global issues. So this is uh, what I wanted to say. We are preparing ourselves for the next summit. We and uh, we are preparing ourselves about the several topics: the access to uh, finances for African economies. That has to do with the reallocation of uh, the uh, drawing rights, special drawing rights. So the funding of growth, and secondly, the healthcare systems and uh, production of vaccines, climate change, the energy transition, as already referred to, the digitization as well. So um, the connectivity, uh, satellites, uh, the transport infrastructures. So Europe. Uh, with the technology, with uh, uh, because of its uh, geographical uh, position, has assets that can be valued. So it is uh, uh, on a winning, winning basis that we'll be able to build things together with the support of the Euro European Bank for Investment, like uh, with the Euro um, African Bank for Development. There are two major topics, agriculture, sustainable development, but also education as well, uh, training, culture, and uh, the issue of migration, of mobility, the support to the private sector, and the economic integration. So these are all the topics that we are preparing ourselves for. And then, but, uh, um, and last but not least, peace and uh, governance. Uh, with a specific focus on uh, fighting terrorism. So we hope to be able to uh, leave Brussels uh, with uh, on a new uh, uh, with a new start for that renewed partnership. But I hope that when uh, going to Brussels, uh, we will see a nice envelope on the table of the Europeans. Because let's put it bluntly, we need money. We need resources to cope with these uh, uh, issues, to fund the uh, energy transition, to fund the building of facility infrastructures, to um, retain the African youth, uh, 
to deliver the right training, the right education, and uh, uh, Europe uh, will actually uh, win uh, out of this uh, through the funding of these infrastructures that I've been speaking about. So this is uh, the point I wanted to make. And once again, I want to thank you very much for that very important meeting. Uh, it seems there has been a fire somewhere. So I don't know exactly what I'm supposed to do now, but thank you very much. Thank you to everyone. President Sal, I understand we also have uh, President uh, of the European Council, Mr. Charles Michel, who's come back to join us. Mr. Michel, the floor is yours. Well, actually, I haven't left, and I have uh, uh, carefully listened to uh, uh, the, uh, all the comments that have been uh, shared. So a few uh, reactions. First of all, I would like to thank all the uh, experts that have contributed with Uh, their comments. Thank you to uh, Makisel for what he has said in his introduction and also following uh, what he has just been, been said. So uh, a few words from me as well. We all agree, I think we are all aware of uh, the fact that the generation, our generation in Africa and Europe is uh, facing a change in the prosperity model. There is awareness now in Europe and everywhere in the world. There is awareness about the fact that the model uh, uh, of development has been based on the ex abusive, excessive exploitation of uh, uh, raw materials. And in the past, what was considered as a waste has now become a resource. This is uh, the very meaning of the circular economy. And I am fully convinced by what Macky Sall has said. And by the way, we uh, had a bilateral exchanges on this on several occasions. We need to be together. We need, we need to be pragmatic. We need to, to uh, make sense. We need to show equity. And I share the uh, European experience. The 27 members of the support of European Parliament two years ago, we were particularly ambitious. We set uh, that objective for ourselves, which was to uh, reach climate neutrality between 2050. And now with the European Commission, we are implementing the, the, the measures in order to reach that objective for the European Union. But the debate uh, uh, that you would like to have, uh, Macky Sall, uh, about the energy mix that uh, to, will allow for development, we do have it in Europe. At the end of December, the European Commission put on the table of the European Parliament and of the member states what we call in the European jargon the taxonomy. So these are the criteria that we're going to use uh, to uh, fund that transition to make it realistically uh, uh, realistic from the economic perspective as well as from the social perspective. So uh, for that debate is legitimate, is fully relevant, and the discussions we are having now um, are anticipating the debate that we will have between the heads of the European governments and African governments. I would so like to uh, come back to the pledge of the 100 billion. If there is one region that has been up to its commitment, to its pledge, so the 100 billion with regard to the climate change, it is the European Union that uh, decided to uh, dedicate uh, 25 uh, billions, and it, five additional billions will be uh, added to that uh, every year. So the, so the 100 billion were pledged a few years ago. Actually, it is not so much for European Union, but for other partners that haven't yet uh, um, materialized uh, the decisions uh, to keep their promises. But as a European Union, we have kept uh, our, our promise. And now, uh, uh, last thing. Uh, well, I would like to say a few words, as many of you have uh, said, about the investment. Well, of course, the investment of uh, infrastructures, uh, transport, facilities, uh, the uh, energy facility, digitization, infrastructures, uh, which is dear to the heart of Thierry Breton. So we need to make the right choices. But it is for Africa to tell which priorities uh, uh, they have uh, uh, 
uh, through the NEPAD, for example, there is a vision of the African infrastructures to be developed. The idea is also to have a to build a con continental area, a free trade continental area. And then vocational training. I know that it is not uh, uh, the topic of today, but still, vocational training, human resources, uh, we know how this is important for Africa, but it is also important for the Europeans. Uh, Europeans, because we're talking about mobility, migration, which is a very uh, delicate matter everywhere. Uh, but there is also intra African migration, which is also uh, a difficult uh, issue for Africa as well. And have, uh, having a very broad vision of uh, migration and mobility, we're taking into consideration the necessary investments in vocational training uh, is also key. And I, I know that this is uh, not uh, the topic of today, but about the health care system, about the health, uh, the COVID has clearly demonstrated uh, that uh, uh, the uh, health care systems are key. And uh, in the European Union as Europeans with regard to uh, the intellectual property and the patents of uh, vaccines, etc. Uh, th there is much to be said about this, but actually the European Union has very quickly reacted thanks to our direct uh, political contact with Makisal Paul Kagame, with uh, the president of the Ghana. So we said, well, regardless of the ideological debate, how can we succeed in bringing together around the same table, the private partners, the public authorities, to launch that project, to make sure that uh, as quickly as possible, uh, through a fast-track uh, initiative, we can uh, uh, produce vaccines and medicines, drugs. And the idea is really to make sure there is a production of vaccines on the African uh, continent. So I want you to acknowledge that the European Union has clearly reacted, has uh, firmly uh, acted uh, uh, on that. Uh, maybe not enough, but we are ready to um, speed up uh, the process and to go even further. And a very last thing, because you talked about this, uh, Makisal, peace and security. There can't be prosperity uh, until uh, there is no peace. So there will be access uh, to uh, employment for the young people. There will be economic development. There will be innovation if there is peace and stability, if there is security and stability. And uh, we also need to actively cooperate for uh, for the sake of prosperity, peace and safety. And. Uh, uh, there are uh, only 14 kilometers uh, that separate the African continent from the European one. But it shows that when there is stability, when there is security, it is beneficial for both. When there is prosperity uh, in Europe uh, and in Africa, it benefits uh, uh, to both. So there is a mutual interest in identifying together over the short uh, and medium and the long term what our priorities should be. And such meeting, the meeting such as today, uh, do contribute to actively listening to one another, to listening to the arguments of one another. And that way we can feed our own understanding of uh, uh, our contributions, uh, of what we are ready to do in order to move forward together. We know that uh, words are fine, but what really matters is to walk the talk, is uh, to uh, undertake actions, to make the right decisions. And there is an African saying that says, what my mouth is saying, my arm does it, uh, activates it. So I hope that that could uh, lead us in our discussion. Thank you of the European Council for sharing that perspective and again underlining how the two continents can move forward together and that you cannot have economic development without energy and we cannot have security without a job creation for young people and vice versa. Well, we began our conversation an hour and a half ago with um, an invitation from Mo Ibrahim, the chair and the founder of the Mo Ibrahim Foundation and the initiator of this series of conversations. You invited us, Mo, to have a conversation that was open, that was frank, that allowed us to really explore the mutual direction of travel, but recognizing the challenges and the differences between our perspectives. I'd like to now pass the floor to you to close our conversation. Did we meet your expectations? Uh, thank you very much. It has been a wonderful uh, conversation. And of course, we had a wonderful uh, panel. But allow me just, I want to mention three points from an African point of view. 
uh, for clarity. Uh, number one, we are not against we, we We love green technology and we love solar. And I believe solar is wonderful. Uh, it meets a lot of requirements in a sparsely populated continent where you can have small isolated communities best served really by solar. That's immediate and quick. That's wonderful. But solar is not enough when we argue for gas because we need to support that. And uh, that's the first point. So please, we are not against, we, we love solar, we love green, but it is not enough. People have to understand that. So instead of lecturing us about the wonderful green trans, we, we know that because we suffer from, from the climate uh, 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 problem more than anybody else. That's the first point. The second point I want to make also about the issue of gas. Uh, we found it, you know, a little bit strange when Europe is wallowing in gas, Russian gas, African gas, uh, putting gas projects everywhere. And uh, when it comes to Africa, no, 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 no. Uh, we don't fund gas there. Of course, when Germany or Belgium or anybody puts a, a gas project or a, even a coal project as Germany did, they don't go to the EIB to ask for funding. Uh, they don't go to the World Bank ask for funding. They just go and do it. But then European directors in the IIB and the World Bank really uh, uh, take that position. Uh, we are not funding. We find that as a really indefensible position. People, our European friends, and they need to understand that. You are using African gas and you're denying us to use African gas. I mean, that is morally indefensible. Uh, the, people need to understand the depth of feeling in Africa about that issue. The third and final point I want to make, if we really want to deal with climate change, the most effective solution is a market-led solution. The only way we're gonna stop people emitting too much carbon is pricing carbon. That that what change behavior. And I hope Europe and Africa in this summit come up with a clear demand, clear proposal for pricing of carbon. That we're gonna help everybody. Finally, thank you very much. And of course, I use the privilege of, of chairing the meeting to, to, to speak too much here. I do apologize for that. And thank you all for our panelists, our moderator, and our, thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Mo. And we've had a really fantastic exchange. And we, we promised at the beginning that it would be an opportunity to look hard in the face of the areas where we have difficulties and where we need to move forward together. And this is the first of three dialogues. The next one will be next Thursday, the 27th of January, where we'll be addressing the issue of migration. And then we have a third conversation on the 3rd of February, which is looking at vaccine access and equity, which was also raised in our conversation today. And our goal was in advance of the high level political dialogue of the Africa Union EU summit to have a chance to have a frank exchange about issues where we need to find common solutions because both continents face this challenge and we need to find a pathway forward. And we, I think we discuss, discussed this issue of the energy transition looking at issues of human rights, issues of looking at how to uh, make sure that the heavy impact that falls particularly on women and children of the lack of access needs to find an urgent solution. So thank you all for participating and sharing some of your comments on the chat. And for many of you who are watching on the live stream, thank you again to His Excellency President Macky Sall, to Mr. the President of the European Council, Mr. Charles Michel, to Thierry Breton, the Commissioner who stayed with us through this, and to other many important people who joined us. Thank you. Goodbye from Brussels.